let me be a little meeker with my brother that we could let me think more my neighbor and a little less of me. Let me dream when I'm weary, just a little bit more cheery. Let me serve a little better so that I'm trying to Let me be a little meeker. I've got a river of life. I've got a river of life flowing out of me. It's the link to walk and the blind to see. Open the prison door, let the candle free. I've got a river of life flowing out of me. Stay up the well. Sing a song, sing a song, friends of kings, there are sad and lovely people everywhere. Be a friend, be a friend, show some love, love. it will live from there to the despair. Show a little bit of love and kindness, never go along with it, you'll find it, take a little time to read for joy and wear.
today, and I'm honored to say this poem for you, The Ragged Old Flag. I walked to the county courthouse square. On a park bench, an old man was sitting there. I said, your courthouse is getting kind of run down. He said, nah, it'll do for our little town. Well, that flagpole there kind of leans a little bit. And that's a ragged old flag you got hanging on it. He said, have a seat, and I sat down. Is this the first time you've been in our little town? I said, yeah, I think it is. He said, well, I don't like to brag, but I'm mighty proud of that ragged old flag. You see, we got a little hole in that flag there when Washington took it across the Delaware. And it got powder burned the night Francis Scott Key sat watching and writing, oh say can you see. She got a big rip in New Orleans with Packingham and Jackson tugging at its seams. It almost fell at the Alamo beside the Texas flag but it waved on through. She got cut with a sword at Chancellorsville. She got cut again at Shiloh Hill. There was Robert E. Lee, Regard, and Bragg, and the south wind blew hard on that ragged old flag. In Flanders Field in World War I, she got a big hole from a big Bertha gun. She turned blood red in World War II. She hung limp and low by the time it was through. She was in Korea and Vietnam. She went where she was sent by her Uncle Sam. Native Americans, brown, yellow, red, black, and white, all shed red blood for the stars and stripes. In her own land here, she's been abused. She's been burned, dishonored, denied, and refused. And the government for which she stands has been scandalized throughout the land. She's getting threadbare and wearing thin, but she's in good shape for the shape she's in. Cause she's been through the fire before, and I believe she can take a whole lot more. So we'll raise her up every morning, and we'll take her down every night. We don't let her touch the ground, and we fold her up right. On second thought, I do like to brag, cause I'm mighty proud of that ragged old beautiful flag. My sermon today is very short. And the reason is it's not really a sermon as much as it is a Sunday school lesson. This series that I'm doing, I have temporarily put aside the Romans series. And the reason is, is because uh, even though your faith is strong, uh, you have youth and young adults in your circle of influence. And they are going to high school and colleges. And they're being taught things about the Bible that are simply not true. And what the situation is, is that this sermon series was inspired by the fact that a very prominent Christian singer suddenly announced that he had abandoned his faith and was leaving his uh, group. And, uh, and I'm not putting the man down because of that. I appreciate very much his integrity and his honesty. And I appreciate the fact that he could have continued in his ministry, made lots of money, but instead he uh, had an issue of integrity and made a decision to leave the Christian ministry. What he did is he wrote a re lengthy letter explaining the reasons why he left Christianity. And I read the letter in its entirety, and I was surprised at the reasons that he gave why he left the Christian faith. And the reason I was surprised is because his father was a pastor and he had been attending church all his life, had been involved in nothing but Christian ministry all his young life, and then at the age, I believe the gentleman's 27 years old, made the decision to abandon Christianity. And as I read the reasons, the intellectual problems that he had, what struck me was that here was a young boy, young man, who was raised in the Christian faith, raised in a Christian church, and his doubts came from such simple backgrounds, issues that I have addressed 
in my pulpit ministry, and I've been involved in pulpit ministry since 1976, it's not like the intellectual problems that he had with Christianity that Christians have not wrestled with for 2,000 years. And so, you know, I wanted to address these issues, not because you have a problem with your faith, but because there are others who do have a problem. Maybe there are some who are watching this video who have legitimate concerns. So the first sermon that I did was on the problem of suffering. And if you remember, I really could not give you an answer because it's a type of answer that comes from years of experience and study. But I put down goalposts that if you really wanted to study the issue, you could follow these goalposts, follow what Scripture says, and you could learn your own answer. And then related to the problem of suffering, last week I began a series on the problem of evil. And again, my answer is not your answer because there are some subjective personal issues that are involved with that. And when because they are personal issues, because they are subjective, that there are, are my emotions involved, my experiences involved, they are of no value to you. It might be interesting to hear as a testimony, but you can't really put your integrity in a person's testimony. It's got to be something that you've experienced yourself, that you have studied, something that you have internalized. And that's why the Bible says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And so my encouragement to you is to study these issues. What I'm looking at today is he had a problem with the fact that there appears to be an episode of genocide in the Old Testament that the Jewish people, after they were freed from 400 years of slavery in Egypt, wandered through the desert for 40 years and then came into the Holy Land. And there were people living there of many different races, but under one bell jar term called the Canaanites. And the, they went in there and they basically, it appears from our reading of scripture, that they massacred the Canaanites. And I've heard this complaint, this problem expressed many times. It seems, if I can, if you'll forgive me for being sarcastic, that the Canaanites were these wonderful people, gambling in meadows, frolicking, making daisy chains, having picnics, and then along comes these nasty Jews with their nasty God, and they kill them to the man, woman, and child, even to the animals themselves. Okay, that's the way it's presented. But history shows a little bit of a different story. Let us go back in time, because if you want to understand the Bible, you have to understand it in its social and its cultural context. And the world of the Old Testament is not our world. Now, I don't want you to respond to this, but if you've had appendicitis in your, I, I want you in your mind to raise your hand, not in reality, in your mind, okay? If you've had appendicitis, I want you to take your hand down, okay? If you've had any type of life altering surgeries like heart surgery or surgery on your liver or anything that if they did not do that surgery, you would have died. I want you mentally to put your hand down. Okay. If you had an abscessed tooth, I want you to put your hand down. If you had a difficult birth and they needed to put you in a neonatal unit, I want you to put mentally put your hand down. Okay. Uh, we're just going to stop there just with those four things. Now, will you humor me, please? If any of you mentally still have a hand up, would you put your hand up for me? <coughs> Nobody? One per one, two. We've got two people in this congregation who put their hands up. You know what that means? This world is so brutal. The Old Testament world is so brutal, you're all dead. Okay? 
This world did not have hospitals. It did not have medication. It did not even have anything as simple as aspirin. It did not have uh, antibiotics. Women died by the droves just from childbirth itself. Childbirth was a life-challenging event. Many children did not live past the ages of four or five. This is a different world. There were wars going on all the time. There was no uh, social security in effect. Your family was your social security. And if you did not have a family, your life was brutal, your life was difficult, and most likely your life was short. Now, there were also very different religions that were present in this world, but very interesting religions in the land of Canaan. When the Jewish people, before they went to the land of Canaan, I need to explain to you, and I can't go into great detail for reasons I will let you know in a few minutes, but they worshipped Baal. There was a god by the name of Baal. Now, Baal, uh, they had a different Baal for every village and every city and every town. There was not one Baal. There was many, many, many different Baals, and they all worshipped these fertility, these uh, forgive me, agricultural gods in many different ways, okay? But every city had its own Baal. Then they had uh, Molech, and they had another god whose name temporarily escapes me. And he was also an agricultural god, but he required human sacrifice. We don't think that Baal required human sacrifice, but Molech and this other god did. And I'll go into that just a little bit more. And then there was another god. There was a fertility goddess by the name of Astarte. And uh, her ceremonies were not ones that I want to talk about from the pulpit. You can revel, or you can get in your ideas the type of revelry that they were involved in. Now, let me talk about Molech and this other god. What they would do is that they would sacrifice children. And Molech was a god of iron, and he had a hollow stomach, and they would build a fire in his stomach until it was red hot, and he was presented as sitting with his hands outstretched like this, and, and they would put a child in his red hot hands. Okay. The longer the child screamed, the more fertile that would be. Now, do you are you getting an idea of who the Canaanites are? Okay. These are brutal, brutal people. And they did not, they archaeologists have discovered that they would kill children as old as four, and they killed them in the thousands. And I could go on even more. I could tell you why they had to kill the animals. You think for a moment, and if, if, uh, if you're willing to go into a very dark place, you can understand why they even had to kill the animals. Remember, this was a place that, they, that did not have penicillin and did not have other antibiotics. The other thing is, is that when... Uh, Joshua led the Israelites into the into Canaan into Canaan. He did not attack civilian populations. Jericho and the other places that are mentioned were actually military outposts. And that makes sense. If you're going to conduct warfare, if you're going to cleanse an area, and if any of you and even including the, those who are watching this video, if any of you think that the Canaanites were nice people, then you, you your problem's not with me or scripture. You've got a bigger problem to deal with. These are people that you do not want to have as neighbors. These are people who would be condemned along with Nazis and other individuals who were involved in terrible, terrible things. So when... Joshua led the Israelites into Canaan. They attacked military outposts. They did not attack civilian cities. The majority, 
places they attacked were not civilian cities. So what happened to the Canaanites? Did, were they eventually completely wiped out? The answer is no. Number one, if you actually read scripture, you'll discover that there were large swaths of the Holy Land that they did not touch. Also, we have something nowadays called the science of genetics. And we can study people's DNA. In fact, there are places you can send your DNA and they'll tell you, you know, your background, you know, and I, that, I find it fascinating. I've done that and uh, made some remarkable discoveries about my own family history uh, going back to the 1600s. And they discovered that the Canaanites were not wiped out to the individual man. Guess where they moved to? They moved to Lebanon. In the high 90s is the percentage of DNA of Lebanese people that are actually Canaanite in origin. And so what they did is that when, uh, when Joshua led, his, led the people into Canaan and they were attacking the military outposts, the civilian, once they attacked the military outposts, the civilian civilizations were not able to defend themselves. They fled up north to Lebanon. So there is not this genocide that everyone was talking about. Plus, you need to remember one thing. According to Genesis chapter 15, God gave Canaan, the land of Canaan, he gave the Canaanites 400 years to change the way that they looked at life, the way that they behaved, the way they, they acted and things as such. He gave them 400 years. Now, how patient is that? Okay, you can read the verse for yourself in Genesis 15, verse 13 and 16. So you have to remember that this is a completely different world. These are, everyone is used to warfare. Everyone is used to, uh, you know, the things that happen. And, and one of the reasons, and this is really not an issue per se, but one of the reasons was, is that you have to remember who was your social security was your family. And so when a side lost and they lost their husbands, they lost their fathers, they lost their social security, they lost their adult males. It may seem brutal to us, but they preferred death than the, the uh, uh, of a sword that was immediate than the slow starvation that would come that came about because they had no social security there was no one there to take care of them and women and children things were very very rough that's why in the in the new testament james writes true religion is this someone uh, to take care of widows and children in their distress and the reason is, is that they have no social security. They have no one to take care of them. So it was the church's job in the New Testament to be the social security for widows and orphans. And so charity work for the Christian church goes back all the way to 2000, 2000 years, two millennia. But the Old Testament is very different because it concerns only one group of people. And that is the Jewish people. And God was working on the Jewish people because he wanted to develop a people that would give birth to his son. You, use, you read the genealogies in Matthew. They, not only would, it, would his son come from that line because he made a promise to Abraham, who was, who was their progenitor, but also that you know he wanted to show and demonstrate to the world that the law in and by itself, the Mosaic law, could not save anyone. All it could do was condemn. Compare the Old Testament, which gives the law, which can only condemn, to, the, to Jesus Christ, who, did, who in John 3, 17 says that Jesus did not come in the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved, and includes everybody now as, as a clarion call of salvation for everyone and the last thing i want to address is that i have individuals who come up to me and complain 
And they say, well, you know, you Christians pick and choose from Scripture. And I said, oh, give me an example. And they said, well, there's certain behaviors that you guys condemn. And yet, when you look in the Old Testament at, the, at these passages that condemn, they're in the same chapter that have some of these really silly rules. Like the length of the robes of the Jewish priests. The fact that you can't have a shirt that is both linen and cotton at the same time. That you can't cut the corners of your head as when you get a haircut. And there's all these silly rules. So those rules are silly and you're not following them. Therefore, there's no need to follow these other rules that you guys are still following in the year 2020. And you're still insisting on such as alternative lifestyles and behaviors and things like that. The thing is, is that that is the worst excuse, that is the worst explanation that you can understand. If you even, such as a, as a, as a casual student of the, of the Bible, the Old Testament clearly contains three types of laws, and they're made very clear. And when you read all of Scripture, it talks about these three families of laws. The, the first group of laws are the temple laws that talk about how the how the sacrifices are to be made, when the sacrifices are to be made, how the, the priest is to dress, when he is to go into the Holy of Holies and offer the main sacrifice for the year, etc. All these temple laws we don't need to follow anymore. You know why? Jesus Christ fulfilled all the temple laws. He was the ultimate Paschal Lamb. He was the ultimate sacrifice. Therefore, Though it is interesting that we see Jesus symbolized in the Old Testament temple laws, we don't need to follow them anymore because Jesus fulfilled them. And we know that because the temple was permanently removed in AD 70 when Rome came into Israel and completely <clears throat> decimated the country, tore down, the, tore down Jerusalem so that not one stone was standing on top of each other, and completely destroyed the temple. And not one stone was left on top of another. And so the temple, there is no temple anymore that if the Jews wanted to fulfill temple law, they can't. There's no more temple. Then there were the specific laws for the Jewish people to set them apart from the surrounding culture. The reason is, is, that, is that God did not want the Jewish people to emulate in any way the Canaanite people. So anything that the Canaanites did, he didn't want them doing. So the Old Testament law has a rule that against tattoos. The reason is he didn't want them to look like Canaanites. He didn't want them because tattoos in the, in the area of the Canaanites was a religious symbol. And it was a devotion to their God. And so they said, so God made a law, no tattoos. The same reason... Why in the, in the New Testament, Paul says to the women of the church, don't braid your hair. You know why? Because Paul was a misogynist and just hated women. We're going to talk about that next week. Is the, does the Bible hate women? The answer is no. Okay. But why did, why is it, did, the, did Paul say that, to the, to the women at Corinth, don't braid your hair. Why do you say that? Well, there, was, there, were, people, there were women who braided their hair. And uh, let's just say that they did their business at night on street corners. I think you guys know what I'm talking about. And so what Paul was saying, I don't want anybody in the church looking like that because people will get the wrong idea. I'm sorry, guys, but, but we are... We are salespeople. We advertise ourselves all the time. And whether we get the right message or not, you've got to take into consideration something called common sense. Okay? And uh, so, you know, we don't want to look like the world. And so, you know, it's, it, it's a difficult situation. I have no problem with tattoos. I'll never wear one myself. But you know what? Tattoos aren't religious symbols anymore. At least they're not supposed to be. So if you get a tattoo, I'm not, I'm not, it doesn't threaten me, you know. But if you come in and you've uh, carved a satanic pentacle in your forehead, you and I will probably have a talk. 
okay? And uh, you might end up in a rubber room wearing a uh, tuxedo with really long arms, if you know what I'm talking about. So, you know, so these are the things, these are basic questions. And this young man left Christianity because he went to a church that was so shallow, it had a thousand miles of spirituality, but its real knowledge of Christ was only an inch deep. And we need to really get into the nitty gritty. Now, like I said, this was not a sermon. This was a Sunday school lesson. And uh, so uh, next week's going to be the exact same. Does the Bible hate women? Let's, let's just put it that way. And we're going to discover that no, the Bible does not hate women. Can women be pastors? Well, you're going to freak out when you hear me say this. The answer is yes, they can. Okay. Well, what about this passage, this passage, this passage? We'll talk about it. So we'll talk about that next week.